Hi, welcome to Chemistry 1001, Thermodynamics. I'm going to talk now about the relationship between delta G and the equilibrium constant. Uh, if you watched the previous mini lecture describing the Nernst equation, which I said was the most important equation in chemical thermodynamics, you will know this equation. This is the Nernst equation. Delta G for any reaction at any concentration of reactants and products is delta G for the reactants and products for that particular reaction at standard conditions plus RT ln Q. Now, what happens if the reaction is at equilibrium? If the reaction is at equilibrium, delta G is zero. Uh, if delta G is less than zero, uh, the reverse reaction is spontaneous. If the reaction is spontaneous. If it's greater than zero, the forward reaction is not spontaneous. And if it's equal to zero, going backwards or forwards, it doesn't make any difference. So delta G equals zero is equilibrium. And delta G equals zero equilibrium means that Q equals K. So we can substitute delta G equal to zero on the left-hand side, provided Q equals K. Then we would get zero equals delta G naught plus RT ln K. Rearranging that gives delta G naught equals mi minus RT ln K. This is a remarkable equation. It's a remarkable equation because by measuring equilibrium constants, we can get delta G values. And remember, delta G values tell you how much work you can get out of a system. So equilibrium constants are pretty darn useful. They can be used to relate to things involving energy. And remember, from electrochemistry, or if you haven't seen that topic yet, delta G is related to the amount of work, which in turn is related to the voltage of a battery. So delta G is related to, or proportional to, the voltage on the battery in a particular chemical reaction, if your reaction is an electrochemical one. Quite remarkable. Let's look now at how the equilibrium constant uh, and delta G depends on temperature. So combining this previous relationship, delta G equals minus RT ln K, with our old one, delta H minus T delta S, we can see how the temperature affects the equilibrium constant. If we just substitute on the left here and divide by minus RT, we will have, dividing by this minus RT, ln K equals minus delta H on RT plus delta S on R. So if we assume, if we assume that delta H and delta S don't change too much with temperature, we do know that they do change, but let's say that the temperature change is pretty small. Then we can plot the log of the equilibrium constant against one on the temperature, and we should get a straight line. And this is what we see here. Log K, ln, uh, versus one on T gives us a straight line. And the slope of the line is minus delta H on R. That's cool. That means not only does uh, delta G give us log k, but the temperature dependence of log k gives us delta h. And look, the intercept when 1 on t uh, is equal to 0, in other words, when t is equal to infinity, 1 divided by infinity gives us 0. So as temperature increases, we come this way. As temperature decreases, we go towards the right. At 1 on t equal to 0, that's infinite temperature. This term drops out. Delta H divided by infinity is 0. And we get an intercept of delta S on R. So the intercept tells us the entropy. Slope gives us delta H on R. Intercept gives us delta S. Temperature dependence gives us two very important quantities from measuring LNK. And these are things that we can see from tables. It's another way to work out delta H and delta S if you don't want to use calorimetry. Calorimetry you use to measure heat and delta S we have to heat things up from absolute zero. That's a bit of a drag. This is a much easier way to do it. How amazing. But if there's more. 
Uh, just let me point out some obvious things. <coughs> Suppose that the reaction is an exothermic reaction. That means delta H is negative. That means the slope of the line you plot would be positive because negative of a negative quantity is positive. So this orange line shows the slope that you would get for an exothermic reaction. This green line shows the slope that you would get for an endothermic reaction. Look, it's not such a big deal because you can tell it's exothermic just by putting your thermometer in there. But it's just to show how the graph behaves. So that's fantastic. But look, now we have the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. Uh, that allows us to calculate the equilibrium constant uh, at one temperature from the equilibrium constant at a, another temperature. Essentially, we use this equation, which is derived from here, on the previous one. Ln K1 is delta H0 on RT1 plus delta S on R. Ln K2 is delta H on RT2 plus the same delta S on R. If we subtract Ln K1 from Ln K2, the delta S terms cancel out, and we are just left with two delta H terms which are here. LNK1 minus LNK2 is delta H on R times 1 on T1 minus 1 on T2. So if we know uh, delta H and we know the two temperatures and we know the constant at one temperature at K2, we can predict it at T1 from this equation. That's great. It's essentially Le Chatelier's principle. Um, Le Chatelier's principle says that for an exothermic reaction, if we add heat, the reaction moves to the left. Endothermic, it moves to the right. This is this equation. LNK does change with temperature, and it changes in a very specific way. It changes according to delta H and T. This is the numerical form of the Le Chatelier principle applied to exothermic and endothermic reactions know how to use it. Uh, we'll supply these exams, these equations in the exam so you don't have to memorize it but to be honest if you remember this one which you can derive easily from these two equations you're home and host and if you don't know these two you're in a bit of trouble. Have fun!